right, so it is 11. Um, I will get us started. Hello, my name is Alex. I am the moderator for this session, uh, Evaluation 101. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, this session it will be recorded and the recording will be available on the SPTHB training site um, after the training summit. Um, and all attendees are placed on mute uh, as they come in just by default. Um, also, uh, we will have a Q&A um, about five minutes uh, before the end of the session. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat uh, throughout the presentation and I can um, relay those when we get to the Q&A session. Um, and if also using the chat, if you have any technical difficulties uh, on your end, you feel free to privately message me or the Zoom engineer, which is Adelmi De Leon, and we can help you uh, try and help you get that sorted out. Also, uh, we will have a meet and speak today at noon central time. Um, the first 100 attendees will uh, receive a $5 gift card to Starbucks. Um, and this uh, meet and speak will just be a way for you to network with other participants, um, discuss, you know, things that you've learned, uh, things that you may want to see uh, next year at another training, at the next training summit, um, things like that. And then lastly, there will be a evaluation for this specific session. I will put the Zoom or the SurveyMonkey link in the Zoom chat um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, this is again, an evaluation specifically for this session. If you have filled out other uh, evaluations for other sessions that you may have attended, um, those will not carry over. Um, and we highly encourage you to uh, fill this out. It's a very quick survey. All right, um, and with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day, Mary Frances Montel. Mary Frances has uh, began working early in her career in a clinical setting and transitioned from direct patient services to programmatic evaluation and continues to work in public health as a program manager. Working now at the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board as the tech fee program manager, she focuses on applying her experiences working in hospitals and with local communities to building inter capacity and infrastructure. Mary Frances, take it away. All right. Thank you, Alex, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm very excited to have everyone here. Um, I started out, like Alex said, I started out as an evaluator here at SBKHB, and I honestly fell in love with evaluation just because there's, there's so much use you can get out of it. And it really helps you map and tell a story about things. So that's why I'm very excited to to talk about evaluation. Um, this is gonna be a training over an introduction to SMART evaluation, S-M-A-R-T. Um, and today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be introduced to a lot of basics of evaluation. We're gonna kind of go on a guided tour, if you will, of how to do a logic model, what the key components are to a logic model. We're, we're gonna introduce some concepts and we're gonna go through them together. We're gonna to do some examples and I've kind of created some mock kind of um, situations that we'll work through as a team. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So some common perils and pitfalls of evaluation. A lot of times when I'm either have someone request to do an evaluation or anytime we start talking about it, uh, people always feel they need to say, well, I'm not an evaluator, so I don't really know how to evaluate. Um, and I like to kind of let people know you don't have to be an evaluator to evaluate. For the most part, people tend to do pieces or portions of evaluation already on their own. Um, but we don't necessarily call it evaluation. But for the most part, people have already been exposed to evaluation and do portions of it by themselves. Um, another tip I like to talk about is if it's possible, start your evaluation or, your, or create your evaluation um, plan before program implementation. Um, your evaluation should serve as a guide. So if you create your evaluation plan before even implementing anything, any activities, um, talking about either inputs or stakeholders, having your evaluation plan helps you kind of have um, a good footing on what you need to pay, um, pay special attention to throughout your program. Um, and lastly, um, if you have, if your award and agency gives you an evaluation plan, absolutely use it. They're giving you this to help you out 
in most cases it's a template um and so you'll need help filling it out and you can add things i've never seen a federal awarding agency say they don't want anything extra but um if they give it to you absolutely use it so what is evaluation The CDC, um, and this is a quote from CDC, they say evaluation is a systematic method for collecting, analyzing, and using data to examine the effectiveness and efficiency of programs. Uh, when I explain evaluation to people, I kind of like to put it in a simpler terms. Um, and I posit it as what, what are these two questions? What is working, what is not, and why? That's what evaluation is to me. So usually when people think about evaluation, it's um, it feels a little cumbersome. People may feel a little bit attacked. Oh, I've been doing things, um, but now you're here to tell me that they're not working and there's a better way to do it. And that's not really how we should look at evaluation. We wanna know what is not working and we wanna know why it's not working. But in the same uh, turn, we also wanna know what is working and why is it not, why is it working? We want to look at our successes and replicate that and we also want to look at our faults so that we can know where it is that we need to make adjustments um, throughout our program implement implementation or our project. So let's get started together. Um, imagine you have a program or a project that you want to evaluate um, and you don't really necessarily know how to get started. Um, you, you may have a lot of information, you may not have any information at all, and you're wondering to yourself, well, gosh, this is pretty daunting. What do I need to do? Um, and here are some questions I always like to ask myself and ask um, whoever it is I'm working with when I'm doing evaluation. Um, so first off, where are you currently at in program implementation? I alluded to it's best to begin before program implementation, but that's not always the case and it's not always possible. Sometimes you may be at the end and people tend to leave evaluation um, to the end of the program. Um, maybe you're right smack in the middle of program implementation, but knowing where you are will really help you create an evaluation that's specific to your setting and to your program. Um, you wanna know, are you starting from scratch? Um, do you have an evaluation plan that was already created? Um, was somebody, are you picking up where someone left off? Um, it's also important to know who the key players are in evaluation. Are you, um, do you have people available to help evaluation? Is it something that you're kind of dividing amongst the team? Uh, knowing people's um, time that they can dedicate to evaluation, maybe they're juggling uh, two or three different things and can't really help with evaluation. So it's important to know who your key players are. Um, I also like to ask, are there, is there any data? Are there any data collection tools already in use or already produced? Um, have people implemented surveys? Is there any results from those surveys? Having all that information in the forefront will help you plan for things. Um, also keeping in mind, what is the overall goal of the program? Um, you want to know where you're headed to. What, what's your destination? Your goal in this case is going to be where we want to end up. Um, what resources are available to accomplish this goal? Um, is the agency organization um, supportive of the goal? Is this kind of a, something that's not really a focus, but something you personally want to take care of? Uh, really knowing where you're at will help. Uh, and lastly, what will the evaluation be used for? Is this something that, you know, it's a requirement to your funding agency, it needs to get done, you need a report, or is this something you're gonna share with community members and your stakeholders? Is it something that you're gonna build off on? Um, it's best to have a real purpose of evaluation aside from reporting purposes, so that you really, uh, the time and effort you put into it um, has a wonderful and beautiful fruition for the people that, it, it, that you're supposed to serve and benefit. Um, and lastly, my biggest note is ask a bunch of questions. Excuse me, Maybe something's not working here. There we go, <laughs> ask a bunch of questions. I, I often warn people as soon as you start evaluation, I, I give them a little warning. I'm gonna ask a lot of questions um, and it's not because I want it to be burdensome, it's because I need to know. Um, and the only way to find out information is to ask questions. And it's all right to ask a bunch of questions um, because you're gonna start forming pieces. All these pieces are gonna fit into a pulse. And that's the best way to do it is to ask questions. All right, so now we're gonna get a little bit more orientated to the key components. Um, and like I said, this is gonna be, um, I'm gonna be talking the whole time, but I'll take a little bit of breaks just to allow people some time to think and work through some examples here. 
Um, but right now in the context of um, your agency or organization, we're gonna start off uh, with a mission. So what we're looking at here, this slide is, is named goals versus objectives. And we're comparing goals and objectives with um, larger and more broader issues where, and as well as smaller indicators. Um, so first and foremost, what is a mission? It's, it's, it's really to describe the primary purpose and function of the agency. Um, in relation to goals, objectives, and indicators, missions are very, very broad. They're not specific. Um, there's something kind of an umbrella where goals, objectives, and indicators fall under. Now, we're, we're gonna, oh, looks like someone unmuted. So just be careful to mute yourselves here, please. All right. So we have, and where we're gonna spend most of our time um, within this training is gonna be goals, objectives, and indicators and more so in objectives, um, and you'll see, you'll find ourselves working through some smart objectives together. So goals, um, goals articulate what the program or project wants to achieve over either the next four years or two years, however long your um, grant is of. Um, and they, in regards to mission and goals, goals are a bit more specific, but for the most part, they remain pretty large and broad. When we come to objectives, that's when things really start to get very, very specific. Um, and your objectives help identify outcome oriented long term goals for the major functions and operations of your program or project. Um, and you'll see kind of this scale I've done here, kind of like this Pac Man mission is the biggest eats the goals, goals eats the objectives, objectives eat indicators, indicators being the smallest here, which are used to determine if a program is being implemented as expected and achieving their outcomes. They help show progress towards a specific goal or objective. And for most, for the most part, indicators include outputs and outcomes. And so we're gonna break these um, three down. We're not really gonna talk a lot about mission just because it's like I said, it's an umbrella, it's the most broad. Um, but really where we'll focus is goals, objectives, and indicators. All right. So the first, uh, we're gonna focus on how to write well-written goals. To have well-written goals, you absolutely wanna have your overall purpose, um, but you need it to be concise. Your goals should project what you want to, um, what you want the project to accomplish. Um, they're broad ideas, but they may not be necessarily easy to measure. Uh, they align with the mission of the program and they're larger in scope. So now we're gonna do a goal together. I'm gonna give you an example and we'll talk about whether it's good or not and how to make it better. So right here, this is an example of a goal. Um, we're going to be talking about the diabetes prevention program. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but that's kind of going to be the context of most of the examples here. So I've created this goal, um, and this is not a very well written goal, and we're going to talk about why. So the goal reads to increase within our area the implementation of the diabetes prevention program among Native American individuals to decrease risk of type 2 diabetes by providing educational approaches to address health and well being. As I'm reading this, I'm already tired. There's a lot going on. We're talking about health and well-being. We're talking about providing educational approaches. We're talking about DPP. We're talking about the risk of type 2 diabetes. There's a lot going on here. So it's not very concise and it's very unclear what we want to accomplish. It's, it's not written very well. So it's hard. It would be hard to measure this goal because we don't necessarily know uh, what it is we're truly trying to accomplish. So this, we're gonna write, I'm gonna give you an example of how to transition this not so well-written goal into a better goal. Um, and to do that, I've used some reference and resources um, from the, a resource on CDC from the Traditional Foods Program with the Native, um, excuse me, the Native Diabetes Wellness Program. Um, and this goal and reference was listed from the Prairie Band Pottawatomie Nation in Kansas. Um, so there's some reference to some programs that they may have done. So now the well-written goal reads, to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes by implementing gathering and gardening methods of preparing, distributing, and using traditional foods for tribal programs and communities. So right here, the first thing we talk about is our purpose, to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes. That's our main focus. That's what we want to accomplish. And everything below that is to contribute to that. 
so it's a little bit evident here that the program or project we're talking about is gathering and gardening. Um, and that's supposed to help in efforts. And so you kind of see a little bit more, it's specific and that's gonna be preparing, distributing and using traditional foods. And it targets and it talks a little bit more about our population and who we wanna work with tribal programs and communities. So you see the well-written goal here is more specific, it's concise, um, and it creates a clear direction of where we wanna start out and what we're gonna do to get there. So I wanted to show what a logic model looks like. This is a very clean and simplified version of a logic model. And a lot of the key components we're gonna talk about contribute um, are gonna be part of the logic model. So we've talked about our goal, we're gonna talk about inputs, activities, outputs, and we're gonna talk about outcomes, including short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So this is all gonna to come together and we're gonna create a logic model um, as a group. So first and foremost, let's talk about objectives. Um, we've talked about goals, really, really broad. Now we're getting a little bit more specific. We're talking about objectives here. So objectives are more specific. Um, they can be easily measured, which is something I absolutely love about objectives. Measurability is very, very great to have when talking about evaluation. Um, and they often include actionable items and they absolutely contribute to the overall goal. They're not contributing to the overall goal. Is it truly an objective worth measuring? Mm, not so much. So now our key focus and where we'll dedicate some time to this in this training is SMART objectives. So S-M-A-R-T, um, maybe some of you have heard of this before, maybe not so much, or maybe you've heard about it, but you've never really played too much around with making a SMART objective. Um, so let's go ahead and break this down. Um, S represents specific. You want your objective to indicate something specific about what we want to accomplish. You want it to be measurable. You need some metrics uh, to determine if the objective is being met. It needs to be achievable by those who are gonna be doing it. It needs to be relevant um, to the work that's gonna be assigned to those people who are doing it and to your um, overall goal. And it needs to be time bound. Let's have a clear time frame for when we need to achieve this um, outcome, uh, excuse me, objective. All right. So here's, um, we're gonna to work together. Uh, we're gonna to work through an example of a not so smart objective. And I've put our goal here. And our goal, our goal is gonna be consistent throughout this entire training. This is our goal um, for the whole time. So we're keeping in mind our goal. I'm just gonna repeat it really quickly. Um, our goal is to decrease the risk of type two diabetes by implementing gathering and gardening methods of pairing, distributing, and using traditional foods for tribal programs and communities. So with that goal in mind, we need to write um, an objective. And so, Right of, and I've already written an example here, but if I was to come up with a not so smart objective, an objective that I know isn't really good, um, but relates to the goal, I came up with increased vegetable consumption. That's something that relates to the goal because we do talk about gardening and gathering methods, about preparing, distributing uh, traditional foods. So I know I wanna talk about something with vegetable consumption. Um, but what, what's wrong with this not so smart objective? It's not very specific. We're talking about an increasement, increasement of what, from where? Uh, we don't have any metrics to start off with, to compare with. Is this achievable? What are we talking about when we're talking about vegetables? Who's growing them? Where are we getting them from? Um, is it really realistic? Do we even have gardens or gardeners or are even people interested in vegetable consumption? And time bound. Um, in aspect of um, our program, is it, can we accomplish this in a year or two years? How realistic is it time bound as well? So let's take a moment here to take a look at this template. So this is another resource from CDC. Um, they have this Word document available. Uh, it's called a SMART uh, objective template. Um, so let's orient ourselves a little bit to what we're looking at here. So you'll see up at the top of this um, table, they have some space dedicated to writing your original not so smart objective. Um, and the left hand column, we have the S-M-A-R-T, each in its own row. Um, we'll talk about, and it asks, you know, the key component specific, what is the specific task? 
measurable? What are the standards or parameters? Is it achievable? Is the task feasible? We have realistic, are sufficient resources available? Is it time bound? Where, what are the start and end dates? And then it has some space on the right hand column for the objective so that you can either write out your comments or questions or make notes. And then at the bottom of this table, we have some space so that we can rewrite our objective book with the smart notes and objectives that we've put together. So um, I've made this, uh, I just edited here the format just to give us some more space so we can work together. And at the top, you'll see again that I have my original goal. We always keep our original goal in mind because our objectives contribute to measuring that goal. So up at the top, I have my not so smart objective. We have increased vegetable consumption. So how do we make this more specific? What do we wanna know about um, increasing vegetable consumption and with who? So I've rewritten this uh, to increase the consumption of traditional foods for health and well-being of adults. So that makes this not so smart objective a little bit more specific here. And feel free in the chat if you wanted to add anything additionally, uh, feel free to add it on as we're working through this together. There's no right or wrong answer. We're just working through it. So how do we make this uh, increased vegetable consumption a little bit more measurable? We talked about having standards and parameters. Um, so what is the baseline measure? These are things I would ask myself. What's the baseline measure? And is there any data, perhaps from a need assessment? Or do we need to use a research um, like the Healthy Pip Healthy People 2020 goals, where it includes some metrics. Um, so we wanna know a little bit more about this. Um, is it achievable? How can we make this achievable? Is there any infrastructure for producing and distributing traditional foods and veggies? Uh, that's something we need to know. So I'm asking, I'm asking myself and I'm asking who I'm working with. Is it realistic? We have to consider the season. Uh, we have to consider gardening needs and preparation. Um, so is, that's what we're, we need to know when asking ourselves, is there sufficient resources available and time bound? Um, so our grant in this example is one year or at the end of grant cycle. So let's take all of these notes in consideration and we're gonna, we're gonna have some assumptions because again, this is not a real example. This is just something we're working through. So we're gonna make some assumptions um, Yes, we had a needs assessment and we asked, um, we asked our, our target group if what was their daily recommended vegetable consumption. So we have a baseline number. Um, we, we've assessed the community does have infrastructure for gardening. Uh, they have a great program already going. So we're excited to get started. And so these are some assumptions we're making just to kind of create a smart objective. So here's our new SMART objective. It reads, increase the daily recommended intake of traditional fruit and vegetable consumption for adults from 10.6% to 15.6% by August of 2020. So this is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. We, we've bound it into, um, we're starting, if we were to pretend let's start in August, 2021, and so the end of our one year is going to be August 22. So that's our time bound. Um, our uh, needs assessment and the population we um, gave the survey to, everyone answered maybe a little bit lower on the daily uh, recommended fruit and vegetable consumption. So that number was 10.6%. That's where we get that. And we think it will be realistic to have an increase of 5% um, vegetable consumption, fruit and vegetable consumption. So that's what I'm saying. We've made some assumptions, but we kept it realistic. Uh, we kept it achievable. We know the infrastructure. We know who we're working with. Uh, the community is excited about this. So this objective makes sense. So we've worked through one example here and our next slide is gonna be exactly the same, but we're gonna work through another, a different not so smart objective. And I'll be given a little bit more time before responding. Just, you know, we've worked through this together. We know how it functions. So let's go ahead and do another one together. And I think it's really important to dedicate time to creating smart objectives, because again, if it's not measurable, how is it contributing to their goal? You're gonna have difficulties 
uh, was in your program showing your effort, um, you want to make sure, and, and this is what I tell my staff, you know, I want to make sure that your time, your efforts, and everything you're doing contribute to the overall goal. Um, it's measurable because um, your efforts are worth it. You know, I know how much time people dedicate. Um, we have some excellent staff that put in uh, a lot of effort and time and really want their programs to succeed. Um, so I make sure through evaluation that we're counting everything you're doing. And an easy way to do that is through your objectives, all your actions contributing to specific objectives. So let's work on another one together. Again, our goal is to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes by implementing gathering and gardening methods of preparing, distributing, and using traditional foods for tribal programs and communities. So if we were to think of another not so smart objective, we're keeping in mind our goal. So let's think about something we, that will relate to this. We wanna talk about participants pre-diabetic status. So our not so smart objective is assess participants pre-diabetic status. So I'm gonna take a little moment here. I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna let you guys think amongst yourselves how to make this specific, how to make it measurable, how to make it achievable, realistic, and time bound. So give yourself a moment to kind of walk through it yourself, ask yourself some questions or answer them of what you would put on the right-hand column within the effective lines. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause and give you guys a couple of minutes to kind of walk through it and think. All right, so feel free to also put your answers or anything you want in the chat. Like I said, we're working through together and there's no right or wrong answers. So how do we make assess participants pre-diabetic status more specific? We wanna know um, how can this objective be made more specific to the program and what is the specific task? So we wanna know the participants pre-diabetes determination. Um, let's talk about measurability. Uh, we need access to the participant's health record or text. If we're talking about pre-diabetic status, then we know we're gonna need to involve either the clinic, we need to know their health records. Uh, we need to be respectful of asking for people's health records. Is that something they're comfortable with? So we need to keep that in mind in terms of if we need this information, uh, we need to be respectful of asking it, or we need to have um, methods where it's very easy to get to gain this information, of course, with the participants um, knowledge. Um, so part uh, the, is it achievable? Participants must have if you're familiar with the DPP program, um, they stipulate participants must have an A1C result within the pre-diabetes range of 5.7 to 6.4. So that's really where participants need to be at. And of course, we're gonna be working towards lowering that so they're out of the risk um, range. Is it realistic? Do we even have healthcare staff dedicated to enrolling and implementing participants to the DPP program? Is there an instructor, um, excuse me, an instructor is the clinic that we're partnering with, do, need, do they need more phlebotomists? So there's a lot of logistics um, that we really need to consider when we're talking about how realistic and achievable it is. Uh, time bound. So the DBP program um, is a year long program and that's how long enrollment is. So let's put together all, again, we're gonna make a couple of assumptions here and there. Uh, we're going to assume that, yes, we already have a partner in clinic or there's already a DPP program ongoing and this is an objective just uh, for them so that we can measure um, and, and uh, contribute their efforts to the goal, to the completion of the goal. So this is our SMART objective rewritten. So our SMART objective reads, decrease the risk of prediabetes in at least 50% of all enrolled DPP participants by the end of year, the year long program, which will end in August, 2022. So we have a time frame. It's obviously a year long program. So we're starting August, 2021 until August, 2022. Um, and we, we specified also the population. Not only is it specific to enroll DPP participants, but our cohort is gonna be 50% of those. That's really our goal. And we're trying to decrease the risk of the pre-diabetes range within these 50%, uh, within 50% of these participants. So you see here, 
Our objective is a lot more specific. We know exactly who we're working with. We know what we're gonna need to make it realistic and relevant. Um, and we know we're working with a community here. All right. So now we've worked through objectives and now we're gonna talk about some indicators. So we're gonna talk about outputs versus outcomes. Now in evaluation or maybe even in program implementation where you're talking about things, uh, people use these words interchangeably, outputs and outcomes, um, which they're both indicators, but they really shouldn't be used interchangeably. They both aid in evaluation, the effectiveness of the program implementation and knowing the difference is important when you're creating your logic model because it's gonna depict the relationship between the effort and the proposed effects. So when we're talking about outputs, we're talking about volume-based. This is gonna reflect project activity versus outcomes, which are more results-based and they reflect behavior changes. So let's work through some examples and, and they're just listed here. So some examples of outputs are more numbers and values-based. Um, so we're in context of the example that we've been doing. So number of sessions completed, pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed, number of enrolled participants. So you see these are values, numbers, volume-based. Whereas outcomes within the same context are more about the impact. We're increasing um, people's understanding of healthy eating, increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, decreasing risk of type two diabetes. And you'll see within this um, chart here, if you read it from left to right, you can see the difference or you can see how things progress that the output gives this outcome. So the output of number of sessions of let's say healthy eating sessions gives an outcome of increase in healthy eating knowledge. The output of pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed would give an outcome of increased fruit and vegetable consumption. So there's a connection between your outputs and outcomes. But again, there's a distinction between um, outputs and outcomes and you wanna be sure to be wary of that. So let's get a little bit more specific about outcomes because they are measure, they're more results-based. So let's go ahead and expand on that. So in that logic model we saw, we know that there's three different types of outcomes. There's short-term, intermediate, and long-term. So let's talk about these three. Short-term outcomes um, are first changes to be seen. They're immediate results. They're a lot easier to, to accomplish, excuse me. And for the most part, they usually lay the groundwork. These are the things that happen um, just organically or naturally firsthand. Um, and they'll lead up to the intermediate long-term. So intermediate, uh, they're obviously a progression of the changes from the short-term outcomes. Uh, they contribute more to the goals and they kind of represent a halfway point to accomplishing them. And they're often built upon to get to the long-term goals, uh, excuse me, long-term outcomes. So the long-term outcomes, um, they usually require the most time to accomplish. They're often built upon and they usually mark the proximity to accomplishing the goals. And we'll have some examples of these so it makes a little bit more sense. So I wanted to map this. I know we've talked about it and it's a little bit hard sometimes when you have all these components going around and we've got the idea of the logic model, but let's, let's cement things a little bit easier. Let's map them. So like um, we alluded to, evaluation is kind of a roadmap. And now we want to see things on paper. We wanna make sure we were understanding things. We have our destinations, we have the places we're gonna stop along this road that we're taking together. So this um, table here has goals, objectives, outputs, and then the three um, outcomes. Remember that objectives are specific results, whereas outcomes are, they measure and evaluate an activity's result. So I've reiterated here the goal. Uh, we should all be familiar with it, you know, decrease the risk of type two diabetes, implementing gathering gardening methods by using traditional foods for tribal programs and communities. We have uh, one of the objectives that we work through together. This is the SMART objective. We're talking about increasing the daily recommended intake of traditional fruit and vegetable consumption for adults from 10.6 to 15.6% by August, 2022. And the output here within this map, this kind of table is, I've selected pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed to participants. 
So if we go back really quickly, I'm just going to do a comparison of the output and outcome again. So the output of pounds of fruits and vegetables is distributed. It relates to an increased fruit and vegetable consumption. So that's the kind of frame of mind we want to keep here. And so if we have this output and we're going to divide it into di three different outcomes, uh, but we want them to work in succession. You know, we can't get to the long term without going through short term and intermediate. So let's talk about when it talks about pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed to participants, what's going to be the first thing we need to accomplish within our outcomes um, to reach this objective? So how about we start off with just increasing participants' understanding of healthy traditional foods? That's kind of the first short-term outcome. You see here that it's um, knowledge-based. Oh, it's not a value. So this is a true outcome. Um, and let's continue. What about an intermediate outcome? What's the next step to this? So how about the actual increasement of the consumption of the traditional fruits and vegetables? One would think, oh, okay, that's already the, that sounds more like a long-term outcome, but there's still another step to this. After we increase the consumption of traditional fruits and vegetables, a long-term outcome of that would be the decreasement of the risk of type 2 diabetes in, partic in participants, which if we reflect back to our goal, that's our primary purpose here. So that truly reflects a long-term outcome. So this is a great way, and, and um, if you wanna have this template, the slides will be available to whoever requests it, um, but just mapping things so that it's clear in your mind, the succession of things. Um, you have your outputs, um, we have a trajectory in our objective and we know how it contributes to the goal. And then we have things we can easily measure um, and our outcomes are gonna help in that. So now we're gonna move into another key component of the logic model, which is gonna be activities and output. Uh, inputs, excuse me. So really quickly, activities are actions that contribute to the program goals. Uh, they're what people do to achieve the aims of the project. And they usually include language like conducting, developing, and providing. Now, inputs are things that are used in the program to implement it, um, often include internal and external staff, material, software, hardware, office space, and this is um, where you would include funding. Funding is an input. So now let's visualize again what we've been doing. Uh, up at this point, we've been actually reverse mapping. So we started the process from the largest measure working towards the smallest. So from a goal to the objective and then outcomes and outputs. And we can use this method to help us move on to the next steps of outlining our activities and inputs. So if we were to look at this here and you see how we're, we're working backwards from long-term all the way to inputs, um, you can either do forward mapping, but just in the context of we've, what we've been doing, we've been reverse mapping. So we're gonna start off with our long-term. So how are we gonna, this is gonna be accomplished, but how? And to accomplish that, we need to go through the intermediate. And so how do we accomplish our intermediate is by completing our short-term. But how do we complete our short-term? We need these outputs. And how are we gonna get these outputs? Um, it's by doing these activities. So let's put it in context of what we've been talking about this whole time. So our long-term outcome, which is from our previous slide, uh, was to decrease the risk of type two diabetes in participants. Well, how are we gonna get there? We're gonna get there through this intermediate outcome, which is to increase the consumption of traditional foods and veggies. Well, how are we gonna get to that intermediate outcome? we're going to increase participants' understanding of healthy traditional foods. And how do we get to that short-term outcome? What outputs do we need for that? We need the pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed to the participants. So before jumping into the activities and inputs, uh, let's just visualize this a little bit differently um, so it makes a, a bit more sense and it's easier to kind of break down and work through. So if the output, which in this case is the pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed to participants is achieved, then what activities are we thinking about that will directly contribute to accomplishing this output? Um, and for example, let's talk about conducting healthy eating trainings, providing free fruits and veggies, developing healthy eating menus. So these are just some examples of activities that we could accomplish that are gonna directly uh, contribute to accomplishing 
uh, getting a value for pounds of fruits and vegetables distributed. So now we have to think about if these activities are achieved, then what inputs will directly contribute to accomplishing the activities? So how about getting some education materials, having gardens, gardeners, um, and even funding. These are gonna be inputs that contribute to the activities. And by doing these activities, they contribute to the output. So let's put that again in our reverse mapping. So again, our output, pounds of fruits and veggies, and the activities we just talked about. So by completing these activities, uh, the outputs will be completed. But how do we get these activities accomplished? By having these inputs, education materials, gardeners, gardener funding. So you see how we worked our way backwards. And this is just an example of something you could do. Of course, you could do forward mapping. Um, it's just up to you and within your, prog your program what you know. If you're only giving a goal, sometimes it's easier to work backwards. But if you're given inputs and you know the infrastructure we have, maybe it's easier to do forward mapping and work from inputs to activities, outputs, and so on and so forth. So let's visualize this in our logic model. We saw it originally in the beginning, but it was empty. And so now we filled out our logic model. We talked about inputs, we talked about outputs, we did our activities together, and we created a short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So this is what it would look like all together in a logic model. And a logic model provides an overview. And it's a visual description of the relationship between, again, the program activities, inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Um, this is a snapshot. And it's uh, really kind of like if you were to look at a map and you had marked your, uh, where you begin and where you end. That's really kind of what a logic model is. So if you'll notice here, um, I've included a little bit more inputs, a little more outputs, because in a logic model, things aren't um, coordinated with each other. It's all together all at once. So you have a logic model and the inputs include, we stopped that funding. So now it includes participating DBP clinics. Um, I included electronic health records. I included food delivery vehicles. These are all inputs that are gonna help out. Um, then we have more outputs now. We have number of sessions completed. We have number of enrolled participants. Uh, we have more activities um, than we had talked about. Developing healthy eating menus, conducting pre-diabetic screenings. Um, I've also added another short-term outcome to increase, we had increased participants understanding the healthy tradition of foods, but now we also have increased participants perceived susceptibility of type two diabetes. Uh, intermediate also has an extra outcome to increase routine pre-diabetic screenings. And then long-term has uh, another outcome, create healthy lifestyle changes for life. So you see everything all together all at once. We have all our inputs, we have all our outputs, we have all our activities, we have all our outcomes all together in one spot. And this is a great resource to share to stakeholders and maybe even the community if they're interested in having something like this of the trajectory. Um, you see kind of the arrows, how everything contributes to each other and what the ultimate uh, long-term output will be and how these all contribute to the goal. Um, but maybe this is not the best tool when it comes to program implementation. You wanna track things a little bit easier. So this is great as a visual, but when it comes to um, program implementation and maybe program management, you want a different visual of how to track things. So we're always keeping in mind measurability and evaluation. This, it helps out tremendously. So let's visualize this in a work plan. So let's orient, our, orient uh, ourselves again to this visual here. So at the top, we have our project period. So our entire project peer, period is two years. Um, in this work plan, we're only talking about year one. Um, and you'll see that's obvious in the column where it says outcomes. We just have um, year one stipulated there. And at the top, we have our outcomes. We have long-term outcomes, intermediate and short terms. Um, they've been numbered one and two. On the left-hand column here, the farthest left, we have the activity descriptions. So these are all the activities that were within a logic model. We just numbered them. And what we're essentially doing here within this work plan is we're assigning specific outputs to specific activities. Uh, we're also uh, stipulating who's the responsible party 
when's the due date, and what's the current status of this activity or output. So let's do number one together. Uh, that activity is conduct healthy eating trainings, and it relates to outcome S1 and S2, which is just shorthand for the short-term outcome one and short-term outcome two. So conduct healthy eating trainings um, directly contributes to the outcome of increasing participant understanding of healthy traditional foods, and it also contributes to increasing participants' perceived susceptibility of type 2 diabetes. Because we're talking about healthy eating, training, we're doing education. And you can see this throughout number two, number three, you see how they all connect. Now I wanna work next uh, to talk about indicators. So indicators, um, and again, this is uh, defined by CDC as, uh, they measure information used to determine if a program is implementing the program as expected in achieving their results. Indicators help track if the program is achieving their outcomes, they elaborate the process towards an objective or goal, so a little bit more specificity. Um, they should be precise and measurable, and they usually assign towards progress. So how do we visualize this though? I'm all about mapping things, I'm all about making sure that things are measurable. So let's talk about another tool to help aid us in that. So here we have an indicator performance tracking table. I personally like these because they help track specific indicators. So in the left-hand column, you have either outputs or, not, or outcomes. Um, it's up to your discretion how you want to create this table. Um, and the first two examples are outputs, whereas the last one is an outcome, so just to show you a little bit of the difference. So the first output is number of healthy menus created. And we have a project baseline date of August 2021, which is when we started, uh, theoretically. And then we have a value of one. As of now, we've only created one healthy menu. But our target for the quarter, which we divided for uh, in the year, it would be our target for this first quarter is actually two. And we actually only have one. So right now for qu the, the quarter period, one reporting period, we have a we've achieved 50% of our target. That's what that percentage represents. Now the life of the project, which is two years, we want to achieve 16 healthy menus created. We want one for each month and maybe four extra ones. And as of right now, the percentage of life of the project target is 6.25. That's just where we're at currently. Uh, our data collection frequencies, we want to collect these bi-monthly. And the data source that we're going to collect uh, from is our distributed menus. So again, we're making connections here. We know what our output is. We know what to expect. Uh, we know where we are in terms of our goal, contributing to our overall goal. We know how often we need to collect this information and we know where we're collecting from. And if we wanna know where it falls corresponding to the work plan activities, this specific output corresponds to activity three. If we were to put this, uh, we were to think about the outcome, uh, the last example here of increased participants perceived susceptibility of type two diabetes um, is a little bit different in the measures. So our project baseline is 45%. And we made an assumption that we surveyed people and we asked them about how, how they felt the risk um, was of having type 2 diabetes. And 45% of participants said that they felt like they had a high risk of getting type 2 diabetes. Uh, that's our baseline. There's no target. That's just our measure. So I haven't put a number in our target column. I put baseline. Our actual, which is uh, what we where we measured is 45%. And we don't have a target for our quarter one period because we're not collecting this uh, with a high frequency. We're only doing pre and post surveys. So I've put pre and post in our data collection frequency. Our data source is obviously the survey that I've referred to. But I did say that our life of project target is 75%. We wanna increase participants' perceived susceptibility of type 2 diabetes, diabetes from 45% to 75%. That's our goal. Um, so again, this is just an indicator performance tracking table and another way of mapping or visualizing all those key components that we've built up together. All right, here, I'm gonna check. All right, and so my final parting words, uh, again, this has kind of been a long journey, a lot of information thrown at you. I've been talking this entire time, um, but my last final parting words here and let's, let's look at this map really quick because we've talked about this as a journey, we've talked about this as a destination. 
um, you'll see here that there's a starting location and an ending location. So we start from number one and the blue line represents um, our evaluation, uh, our, our goal. That's where we wanna go. We wanna go to where number two is at. But in reality, we end up making a lot of stops. The green line, the raw tracking line, is what actually happened within program implementation. You know, things didn't go smoothly, or we had to be really creative and go here and there. And so our actual program implementation resulted in this green line instead of the blue line, which what we were hoping for. So it's important to document exactly what you've been going through. So final parting words, document. Make sure that throughout your program implementation, you're knowing exactly what's happening. And that's why I've given you all these different examples of tools to help you visualize and map things because things don't necessarily go as we always want them to. And that's fine, that's not necessarily a problem, uh, but that's an opportunity for lessons learned. Um, and that's an opportunity to either replicate that either for the next year of the program um, or even for other communities doing similar things. And so I always say document whatever you've been doing. And that's my last final parting words. Um, I have my contact information here. Um, either you can email me at mmontelsbthb or you can email TA help if you wanna do some more one-on-one -on -one evaluations or you have some general uh, evaluation questions or something specific to the program or project you're working on, feel free to email me and we can talk it through and work together. And we can even create some of these tools together if you're comfortable with that. Uh, so at this time, I wanna go ahead and open it up to questions or the chat um, and see if you guys have anything to say. That was a really great presentation, Mary Frances. Um, definitely learned a lot. Uh, learned a lot about SMART goals and logic models. Awesome. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask it directly or you can put it in the chat um, and I can uh, ask Mary Frances that. Um, and again, I will put the evaluation for this session in the chat as well. Again, this is specific to this session. Um, and if you filled out other evaluations, those were specific to theirs, so it doesn't um, carry over. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so just unmute yourself or um, put it in the chat. I always feel evaluation is scary. I tell people, don't be scared. Evaluation should be fun. You're tracking all your efforts and it's important to, to showcase the effort that you've done. And that's what evaluation can do, showcase all of your efforts. Okay, um, Gifty Crab says, is what you have presented today, what can, constitutes an evaluation plan or um, is it an entirely different document? So this definitely can constitute an evaluation plan. There, it's not an entirety of evaluation plan, but it is portions and pieces of it. Um, so having these tools and things and key components here uh, definitely contribute uh, heavily to an evaluation plan. I'd say what's missing here to make this an evaluation plan would be a lot of language. Um, having language about the purpose, the history of the program or the funding, um, having a lot more specific language about what you intend to do with evaluation, um, essentially that, you know, if you were to put all of this into one document and then include that language, then you'd have yourself an evaluation plan. Let me know if that answered your question or if you'd like to me to rephrase that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that really explains it. Thank you. And if anyone doesn't have any more questions, not a problem, uh, feel free to email me. And if not, um, also feel free to head over to our Lunch and Learn so you can get there first. I know the first 100 participants uh, get a prize. So feel free yes. to hurry on over there. Yes, you you did my, the plug for me. Um, yeah, I was <laughs> gonna remind everybody that that starts in about five minutes. Um, you can go over to the SBTHB dot org slash training dash summit and you can um go through there uh to get to the 
um, meet and speak. Um, again, thank you so much, Mary Frances. Uh, if anybody still has any questions, we have about five minutes before the session ends. Um, if you think of anything after the session ends, uh, Mary Frances' contact information is on the screen. So um, I'm sure she'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, any of your burning questions. Also, uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, um, you can email me. I'll put my email in the chat as well. Uh, and we can get that uh, sorted for you. Um, and Mary Frances, are you able to share your slides with participants or do they need to message you about getting them? Yes, uh, feel free to email me if you'd like the slides and I can email you the presentation to you. Um, the, the, also, the presentation includes some references. Um, so if there was tables and templates that you were interested in having, um, I can just email you the presentation and you'll find um, citations within the slides. All right, um, I see that people are starting to filter out. So um, if you have, again, uh, if you have any questions after we close out the session, um, feel free to uh, email Mary Frances. Um, and if you need a certificate of attendance, um, you can uh, email me. And we hope to see you guys at the meet and speak. Have a good day. <laughs>